it's uh, uh, really my great, uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, today's uh, Just Lunch uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Ronnie uh, Grinberg uh, uh, from the History Department in the Schusterman Center, uh, uh, teaches uh, courses in America, American Jewish history, women and gender history, intellectual history, and social movements. She's currently completing a book manuscript about the New York intellectuals, a prominent group of mostly male Jewish writers and critics of mid-century, examining them through the lens of uh, gender and ethnicity. Uh, this is, of course, uh, today's talk is part of that project. And I'll let Professor Grimberg explain what part herself. Um, her book uh, is under contract with Princeton University Press. Uh, and uh, an article uh, from the book uh, entitled Neither Sissy Boy Nor Patrician Man, New York Intellectuals and the Construction of American Jewish Masculinity uh, appeared in American Jewish History, the premier journal of the field, and actually won the 2014 Wasserman Prize for Outstanding Article. Uh, Professor uh, Grimberg teaches the US survey, uh, God bless her, uh, women and genders uh, history and topics related to uh, American Jewry, including uh, Jews in Hollywood, uh, which she is currently teaching. She received her uh, PhD from Northwestern, a chancellor's distinguished postdoctorate at University of Colorado Boulder, and her Bachelor of Arts from Barnard College, Columbia University. Um, I will say, uh, for those of you who don't know um, Ronnie, um, I can say she already has a national reputation and has been invited um, around the country uh, already to speak uh, on uh, today's topics, uh, sometimes uh, representing, uh, uh, sometimes with people who are 25 years her senior uh, and uh, I've heard the uh, uh, lectures and she always holds her own and then some. So uh, uh, let me uh, please introduce uh, Professor Ronnie Grimberg. Hi everyone, um, Alan, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be the last just lunch speaker um, in this very strange, long year. And like Alan said, I hope next year we are meeting in person um, for these talks, but I'm honored to sort of be ending the year. Uh, my talk today is entitled, um, I do actually have a, I should put it up, I have a PowerPoint mostly because um, while I like my the intellectuals I study and they're, they're fun to sort of look at as I'm talking about them. But also this is the first Zoom lecture that I have given and I don't really wanna stare at my face either. So I thought it would be nice to have um, a PowerPoint. So um, let me put that up. Um, I go to share screen, I believe. Um, uh, try or share, let me see if this works. Are you seeing the screen? Oh, good. Let me put it, wow. Yeah, this is the first time I, this is good because I'm also doing another talk in a couple weeks. So this is good practice with the technology. All right, so let me go to presenter view. Everyone got it? Awesome, okay. So as Alan mentioned, um, this talk is uh, drawn from a larger project that um, is going to hopefully be published uh, soonish. And hopefully this is the last time that I'm speaking about this particular project at this forum. But it's fitting in many ways that I'm talking about Norman Podhortz and his wife, Midge Dechter, um, as I work furiously to sort of finish this book, because it really brings my project uh, full circle. Um, and again, the, the title is Midge and Norman, the first couple of American neoconservatism. So I first began thinking about this project, though with a very different set of historical questions when I was in graduate school. And not to date myself, but I am. 
um, somewhat. Uh, part of those years overlapped with the administration of George W. Bush. And some of you um, who are, you know, my age or older, I suppose, <laughs> may recall that there was a lot of talk about the influence of neoconservatism in the Bush administration, particularly after the September 11th terrorist attacks. And in response to those attacks, uh, Bush launched the war on terror, first by sending troops into Afghanistan to root out Al Qaeda, the terrorist organization headed by Osama bin Laden and responsible for those attacks and to disrupt the Taliban, which harbored um, or hosted uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, and after declaring mission accomplished um, somewhat infamously in 2003, the Bush administration shifted its attention to Iraq. And by this point, the administration had put together a set of foreign policy pillars that were influenced by so-called neoconservatives. The Bush doctrine, as it came to be called, argued that the United States had a right to launch preemptive and unilateral war to defend itself against rogue states and terrorists. And the Bush administration used this justification to invade, invade Iraq, arguing that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and that his regime provided a haven to terrorists, um, in particular to Al Qaeda. And both of those accusations um, proved false. Um, I mean, I think that's pretty, uh, most people would, come, would, 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 would say that, okay? But I wanna emphasize that neoconservatism did not initially refer to a hawkish and aggressive, um, critics would even say belligerent set of foreign policy principles. Rather, the term was first coined by the socialist Democrat, Michael Harrington. Um, he was also author of the influential 1962 book, um, The Other America. Uh, about poverty in the United States and which influenced um, President Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson and the Great Society. But Michael Harrington coined the term neoconservative as a pejorative to describe formerly liberal and left-leaning intellectuals who became conservative in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. They were new conservatives, hence the neo, neoconservatives. Now these intellectuals right word shift was not really catalyzed by foreign policy initially, but by domestic politics. Many of these intellectuals were appalled by the radical militancy and increasing violent um, protests of the 1960s by the new left. And the new left is an umbrella term for the social movements of the 60s. Um, and the neocons were, or the emerge, this emerging group of intellectuals were a especially critical of the anti-war movement um, and the violence that they saw associated with the protests um, of the anti-war movement in the late 60s and black power. But I also wanna emphasize that they weren't fans of li women's liberation either. And I'm gonna get to that uh, in my talk. Many of these intellectuals were also social scientists and even though they supported um, the welfare state established by President Roosevelt in the 1930s, they were increasingly critical of the expansion of social policies under President Johnson's war on poverty and his great society programs, which they argued weren't working and were expensive. And in 1972, they felt the Democratic Party itself had veered too far to the left when it nominated George McGovern for president and adopted something called the New Politics Platform, which was crafted by left, the left wing of the party and which sought to distribute power away from traditional party leaders to rank and file members and also to add uh, more women and minority voices uh, to the leadership of the Democratic Party. And by the 1980s, the neoconservatives were stalwarts of the Reagan revolution. Now, many of these original neoconservatives emerged from the New York intellectuals, a group of prominent writers and critics in the post-war years. 
This group first coalesced in the late 1930s around the journal Partisan Review uh, and relaunched, let me shift slides actually. Uh, and Partisan Review was relaunched in 1937 as a modernist, radical, but critically anti-Stalinist publication. The Partisan Review Group, as these writers and critics were initially known, opposed the communist dominated popular front of the 1930s. That made them premature anti-communists uh, in the words of Nathan Glazer. Uh, and indeed a fierce and sort of committed anti-communism was a defining characteristic of this group. So was Jewishness. Um, most of these writers and critics were as Irving Howe once famously put it, by birth or osmosis, Jews. And many of them were also men, okay? And my book deals with this whole subject. Now, these intellectuals rose to prominence after World War II. They penned some of the most influ influential essays and books of the mid 20th century. And in the process, uh, they helped define and delineate the Cold War liberal consensus. They also founded and edited a slew of influential journals. Um, Irving Howe famously, he has a lot of great one, actually all of these figures have a lot of great one-liners. You're gonna hear a lot of them today, but Irving Howe famously said that when intellectuals can think of doing nothing else, they start a magazine. And the magazines associated with the New York intellectuals included Commentary, founded in 1945 by the American Jewish Committee, but really created by a man named Elliot Cohen, who served as its first editor. Um, he was editor from 1945 until his untimely death in 1959. In 1960, the American Jewish Committee named Norman Podhoritz as the editor of Commentary, and he held that position for 35 years until his retirement in 1995. And I'm gonna be talking about Commentary under his reign um, a lot in this talk. Um, other journals associated with this group were Encounter, which was a London-based magazine founded by the Congress of Cultural, for Cultural Freedom in 1953 that was first edited by Irving Kristol, also a very famous uh, neoconservative. And Dissent, founded by Irving Howe and Louis Kozer in 1954. There was also the New York Review of Books, founded in 1963 during, during the New York City newspaper strike and The Public Interest, founded in 1965 by Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell, and later edited by Kristol and Nathan Glazer. Okay, so lots of journals, um, prolific writers, um, writing on a host of issues. Uh, commentary and The Public Interest were at the center of the neoconservative rebellion or mood, um, it wasn't really a movement, uh, but this neoconservative impulse in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And their editors, Podhoritz, Crystal, Bell, and Glazer, are often cited by journalists and scholars alike as sort of the elder statesmen of neoconservatism. And like the milieu from which they emerged, Many, though certainly not all, um, of these intellectuals uh, who were tied to this neoconservative um, moment, mood, were Jewish. And I want to emphasize, you know, commentary was founded by the American Jewish Committee. Now, the magazine and the AJC were their own entities. The AJC gave commentary editorial freedom, but the connection was always there. Moreover, even as commentary ran articles of general interest throughout its history and appealed beyond the Jewish community, it was known as a Jewish publication. Elliot Cohen, the first editor of commentary once quipped, 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 <laughs> the main difference between partisan review and commentary is that we admit to being Jewish, uh, a Jewish magazine, and they don't, okay. So when Pothorts remade commentary as explicitly a conservative, a neoconservative magazine in the 1970s, it marked a notable break from the historically left liberal political persuasion of American Jewry, which as a community had voted overwhelmingly democratic since the 1930s. Irving Kristol, 
known as the godfather of neoconservatism, described the reaction he got after he voted for Nixon in 1972 as the equivalent of a Jew ostentatiously eating pork on Yom Kippur. Okay. Yet few of the New York intellectuals initially associated with this current of thought or mood as the political scientist James, Quil um, James Q. Wilson once described it, remained tied to neoconservatism for the long haul. Daniel Bell always rejected the neoconservative label. In fact, he got very annoyed to the end of his life. Um, I think he passed away in 2000. 13, 14, but until the end of his life that he was a, so, that he was always called a neoconservative, okay? Um, and I spoke to his son, the historian David Bell, um, who's a, a very um, eminent historian of France at Princeton, and he, he reiterated this point, that his father is not a neoconservative. Um, and Daniel Bell rejected the label, and he always described himself as a socialist in economics, a liberal in politics, and a conservative in culture, okay? And he actually left the public interest after founding it with Crystal in 1965. He leaves it in 1973 because he took issue with Crystal's increasingly conservative politics and his full throated embrace of the Republican party. Um, and Nathan Glazer takes over as co-editor of the public interest in 1963, in 1973, excuse me, with Crystal. But Glazer too eventually distanced himself from the neoconservative label. In the 1990s, uh, he reversed his earlier opposition to affirmative action. And then in, the two, in 2005, he wondered how the term neoconservatism morphed from a political tendency that dealt almost entirely with domestic policy questions to one that deals almost entirely, indeed entirely, with foreign policy is an interesting question. Even Crystal, um, even um, Irving Crystal, who relished the label neoconservative, um, he famously described a neoconservative as a liberal mugged by reality. Uh, was a foreign policy realist and didn't easily fit into the confines of neoconservatism by the Bush era. So I wanna emphasize that neoconservatism is a really slippery term um, that can easily be misused because its meaning has changed over time, okay? Only Podhoretz has spanned the entire trajectory of neoconservatism. And significantly, so has his wife of more than 50 years, Midge Dechter. Dechter appears only as a footnote in most studies of neoconservatism, but I wanna emphasize that their conservative journey, journey was a joint one. Um, and Trice did a great job of finding a really lovely picture of the two of them <laughs> together recently, looking like a, you know, like a Zaidi and a, a, a Saba. Um, uh, they're much more, fierce in their politics than this picture um, would indicate. Um, significantly, both Pod Horitz and Dechter wrote about gender. And gender, I argue, is central to understanding neoconservatism in all its stages. Concerns about masculinity, sometimes explicitly Jewish, but most of the times about virility more general, uh, especially when it came to foreign affairs, undergirded Pod Horitz's earliest writings and shaped his interventions in the policy battles and culture wars of the 1970s and 80s through the present. Dechter, meanwhile, wrote at length about women and sexuality beginning in the late 1950s, okay? And in the 1970s, she was a fierce critic of second wave feminism and later of gay rights. And by 1980, her polemics really melded into a family values discourse that was fostered by the new right, um, sort of the conservative uh, movement within the Republican party in the second, or in the last quarter of the 20th century. And in the 1990s, Dechter even questioned the continued usefulness of the word neoconservative, arguing that there are no more neoconservatives. We're just Republicans, uh, conservative Republicans. Now, as far as I know, no scholar has put Podhortz and Dechter's writings in conversation with one another, 
few, as I mentioned earlier, have even examined Dechter's writings in depth. She's really usually treated as kind of, she's, she's, her name is cited, but no one's really talked about her um, prolific uh, writings. Yet looking at Podhoritz and Dechter in tandem provides a window into the multiple iterations of neoconservatism, as well as how neoconservatism became part of the larger conservative movement within the Republican party and has stayed that way, okay? So I wanna focus first on Midge Dechter and I actually purposely entitled uh, this talk Midge and Norman with Midge first um, because I argue that her writings always had a conservative bent, okay? Even in the late 1950s and the early 1960s when this group was entirely associated with sort of liberalism um, and the left, okay? Um, again, Dechter began writing in the early 1960s, 1959, 1960. And these were years that Podhoritz would claim that he was an enthusiastic supporter, um, even an intellectual sort of mentor of the new left, okay? And this has been a widely accepted story that Podhoritz started off as a radical left, or well, that he was a Cold War liberal, then he became a radical leftist, and then he shifted right to become a conservative. But I think if you look at Dechter's and Podhoritz's writings together and with an eye to gender, it's a debatable claim, okay? And I'll return to this point later. But first, just a few biographical details about Midge. Uh, she was born Midge Rosenthal in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1927. She moved to New York in 1946 at age 19 to study at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Seminary. But soon after she arriving, she um, met and married uh, Moshe Dechter, um, also a writer, uh, 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 and, and later he becomes known actually, I think as fighting for Soviet refugees. I don't know as much about him, but she marries Moshe Dechter. Um, he's a veteran completing his education on the GI Bill. Uh, and so she quit school within a year because she claimed that she didn't really like it. And also because she needed to earn money to support her husband as he finished his schooling. And her first job was as a secretary at the newly established Commentary Magazine, okay? And during these years, uh, Midge and Moshe had two children together, but by 1952, they were divorced. Four years later in 1956, Dechter married Podhoritz. The two had actually met in the late 1940s at JTS. Uh, Podhoritz was studying at Columbia University and taking classes at JTS, but they didn't become romantic uh, until they reconnected at commentary in the mid 1950s when a very young Podhoritz began contributing to the magazine. And Podhoritz and Dechter had another two children together uh, and Podhoritz became the stepfather and father figure to her two children from her previous marriage. Uh, and they remain married to this day. Uh, they're still alive. Uh, they are the last uh, or two of the last living New York intellectuals, um, especially now Morris Dickstein, if any just passed away. Um, uh, and as my talk is entitled, uh, they're the first couple of American neoconservatism. I want to share some tidbits from Dechter's writings between 1960 and 1980. And you'll see that there's a remarkable consistency in her views on issues related to sex and gender over this 20 year period, um, which I argue suggests deeper roots for her conservative politics. And I gave a just lunch two years ago on her anti-feminism. Um, most of this is a little different, but if you recall that uh, it's connected. In 1961, Dechter published an essay entitled Women at Work about societal fears of working women. She wrote, to judge by the literature in popular magazines and professional journals, journals, American society is about to be confronted by nothing less than the eventual castration of its entire male population. Dechter was commenting on the same fears that Betty Friedan analyzed in The Feminine Mystique, published two years later in 1963 and which helped launch second wave feminism. Friedan famously castigated such assumptions as part of the feminine mystique. 
a set of cultural ideals that extolled domesticity and defined a woman's identity solely as a wife and mother. And so in the process denied women the ability to cultivate a sense of self um, and individuality through work and careers. Dechter, on the other hand, downplayed the idea that women wanted to work and really validated the efficacy of traditional gender roles. A woman's relationship to salaried employment, she argued, differed from a man's. As a general rule, Dechter wrote, women do not define themselves by what they do or try to be um, as successful as possible. Instead, women worked briefly and only during certain stages in their lives. Women, Dechter, unlike, you know, unlike Friedan, women suggest, or Dechter suggested that the ultimate goal of women was to be married, and most of them didn't want to work once they were married. Okay, so they're coming to two sort of drastically different conclusions about um, you know, gender discourses in the 1950s. Dechter also dismissed the issue of gender discrimination in this 1961 article. And while she acknowledged a good deal of prejudice against women in the men's world, I'm quoting her, she argued that employers had sound reasons not to hire women. They justly hesitated, she wrote, to invest the time and the money required for training women to assume responsibilities, which they will chuck for marriage or to have a baby or to answer, answer the urgency of some other family need. This was not a form of gender discrimination, according to Dechter, but a reflection of women's natural life cycles. If women suffer the disadvantages of being deprived of opportunities to hold the best jobs on the highest echelons, she wrote, it, would, it was because of this irrevo irrevocable privilege. They always have a place to retreat when failure threatens. This is not what they really are, what they really do. As the sexual revolution of the 1960s heated up, Dechter also addressed the topics of sexuality and premarital sex. In a 1964 essay entitled Secrets, she warned that premarital sex had not been liberating for women. Women, she noted, used to only have to worry uh, about uh, not getting married before they were considered an old maid. But now because of the loosening of sexual mores in the 1960s, they had to contend with far more serious issues, um, including male desertion and unwanted pregnancy. And Dechter argued because of this, many women were opting out of heterosexuality altogether and embracing lesbianism, which she described in this essay as a growing popular form of female chastity. In Dechter's neo-Freudian sort of worldview, um, lesbians were immature women who refused to grow up. Their rejection of heterosexual marriage was a means of retreating into girly, girlishness, is how she put it, uh, and avoiding the demands of adulthood. And Dechter, as we're now gonna see, makes these same arguments verbatim in her critiques of women's liberation almost a decade later, um, and many, many more arguments, I should say. Um, but the roots were already planted in 1961, 1964, okay? Um, women's liberation doesn't really burst or onto the scene until um, the mid 1960s. So in 1972, Dechter published a book length attack of the women's uh, movement entitled The New Chastity and Other Arguments Against Women's Liberation. And you can see she's borrowing terminology from that 1964 essay, right? And she rails against the movement from various angles in this book, but I wanna focus again on the vitriol that she directed towards lesbians. Lesbians had become a major force in the women's movement. Um, and Dechter again, um, and so, you know, Dechter, Dechter, I guess has reason. I mean, it's a good way to attack the movement because lesbians were important. They definitely were not the whole movement, but they're some of the most sort of um, producing some of the most cutting edge, I guess, theories of the women's movement in the late, uh, in the early 1970s. And Dechter again argues in this book that lesbians were women who refused to grow up. 
uh, and that they practiced a form of chastity. But Dechter took her argument much further in this book. Uh, she argued by escaping the male phallus, and I want to say that Dechter uses much more explicit language and discussions of sex in her book, which I deemed um, too X-rated for a just lunch, but she, she doesn't hold back. Uh, and so she says, by escaping the male phallus, the male organ, lesbians offered the women's movement a very, and here I'm quoting her, a very useful ideological underpinning uh, for the dispensing with men. And indeed, in Dechter's view, lesbians embodied the basic founding passion of the women's movement more broadly, which was enmity of men, okay? Um, and I'm quoting her. Now, Dechter also briefly addressed homosexuality in this book, but merely as a comparison for lesbians, okay? Um, again, the, the, the focus of the book is the women's movement. Female ho homosexuals are different from male homosexuals, she wrote, in that they slip far more easily according to convenience, both into and out of homosexual practices. So Dechter sort of suggested that lesbians weren't committed to their sexuality and they could just as easily end up in a heterosexual relationship. Gay men on the other hand were no, were very different, okay? They were much more sinister because they unequivocally rejected heterosexuality and the act of producing children, which she equated to a rejection of mortality itself. Now, a decade later, Dechter expanded on this um, subject of gay men in a notorious essay that appeared in commentary called The Boys on the Beach, uh, which examined Fire Island, a gay-friendly beach community on Long Island where Dechter had long vacationed with her family. And this article really was a cruel attack on gay men um, and it engaged in the crudest of stereotypes. Um, and this was realized by critics at the time who, who read the essay. Um, Dexter, Dexter cast gay men as not only effeminate, but vain, materialistic, superficial, um, as prone to alcoholism and suicide because of their immoral lifestyle. Um, and she also argued that gay men were not real men because by definition, they were undomesticated by women. Real men, Dechter argued, had to accept the responsibilities of marriage and fatherhood. And gay men did nothing of the sort. Gay men, in fact, taunted straight men for their choices. Um, and here I'm quoting her, their smooth and elegant exteriors, untouched by modern family existence, constituted a kind of sniggering to their striving and harried straight brothers. See what you have got yourself into, they seem to be send, saying. No wonder you have so much less for yourself and you look it. At the same time, Dechter also accused gay men of tormenting women by impersonating them um, and competing with them through female dress and manners. Homosexuality was dangerous precisely because it sought to rid society um, and here I'm, I'm quoting her, of the human condition which necessitates a division into two sexes. Without deference to distinct sex roles and their containment with mar within marriage, gays, um, homosexual men, gay men, threatened the stability of the entire social order. Okay. Um, I'm gonna shift over now to Pot Horitz. Um, here's some pictures of him as a young man. Uh, the one on the left, I think, is when he's first starting at commentary. And there's a sort of famous, and the one on the right with the cigarette is the, the shot that he put, that he put on outside his first book, a collection of essays, uh, um, where I think he's trying to look quite manly, um, James Dean-esque. Uh, but anyways, uh, okay. Uh, in 1979, Norman Podhorst famously charted his political conversion from self-identified radical to neoconservative um, in the second of what becomes three memoirs that was called Breaking Ranks. Now, according to Podhorst's version of events, 
after he took over as editor of commentary in the 1960s, he moved the magazine in a decidedly leftward direction. He was drawn to the popular attacks on conformity uh, and anti-communist orthodoxy that sprung up in the late 50s. And so he decided to break free, as he later explained, from the new liberalism, the kind that was at once pro-American and anti-communism, um, which sort of defined his New York intellectual milieu. And Podhortz claims that he embraced the new left uh, in these years uh, when he became editor of commentary. So for the, you know, much of the 1960s. But by the late 1960s, Podhortz had had enough. Uh, in Breaking Ranks, he wrote that the radicalism of the 60s was an infection of self-hatred and self-contempt so perilous that it jeopardized everything from American foreign policy um, to traditional sex roles. 60s radicalism, in his words, was a plague. Symptoms first appeared among the white young who refused to assume responsibility for themselves by taking their place in the world of adults. And among Blacks um, in the form of their refusal to accept any responsibility whatsoever for their own condition. By the late 1970s, Podhoritz warned that this plague was spreading among the kind of women who do not wish to be women and among those men who do not wish to be men, right? Referring here to feminists uh, and gay men. Young radicals, Podhoritz concluded, had fostered a culture of sterility. This identification of sterility with vitality, he wrote, is what links the new narcissism of the me decade to women's lib and the gay rights movement. And it's what links all of them to the radicalism of the 1960s. Now, if Podhoritz's language sounds familiar, it's because it sounds a lot like Dechter. And I suppose it's not surprising given that the two were married. Uh, but when I interviewed Midge Dechter, she was adamant that she and Podhortz did not collaborate and rarely discuss their writings. Sometimes we made suggestions, but for the most part, not, she told me. Um, yet, of course, it's hard to imagine that they didn't communicate about these issues over the years. Um, they were married, they are still married. And I bring this up because between 1960 and 1970, when he began writing short editorials and monishing all aspects of the new left, uh, in the pages of commentary. Podhoritz himself wrote very few articles. Uh, he was busy editing and also writing his first autobiography, 1967's Making It, uh, in which he discussed undergoing a extended writing block in these years. He wrote only two long pieces during this decade, both in 1963. Uh, one was a response to the controversy engendered by Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The other was an article um, that sort of became infamous entitled My Negro Problem and Ours. Um, it's one of Podhortz's well uh, most well-known pieces in which he analyzed black Jewish relations uh, through autobiography and looking at his own experiences growing up in the 1930s and 40s in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, and he famously wrote in this essay that his African-American peers called him a sissy, the most dreaded epithet in American boyhood, okay? Because he was a studious uh, and well-mannered and smart Jewish kid. And I'll come back to this point, I hope at the end of my talk, though I'm actually seeing time. I think we started quite late, but um, I might, well, I'll, let me go a little bit longer then maybe I'll end a little early. Um, but because Podhoritz wrote so little, it's difficult to ascertain what Podhoritz's political views actually entailed in the 1960s. Yes, he published leftist writers like Paul Goodman, um, Stodden Lind, and William Appleby Williams in commentary, which he later heralded as proof of his radical credentials. But when I asked Dechter whether Podhoritz was ever a radical, she hedged. Yes, she answered, but she added, you see, he could never be a true radical because he was never anti-American. I then asked her whether his um, choice to publish these radical writers reflected a share of politics or whether he published them more to make a splash. 
a name for himself after becoming editor of Commentary Magazine at age 30. Dechter replied, I suspect that somewhere in him, there was the impulse um, to do a little shaking up. Alan, do you want me to stop or keep going? Well, um, uh, why, why, why don't you like take another five, 10 minutes and then there'll be still some time for, some questions. Time for questions. Okay, I think yeah. we, yeah, okay. Um, let me keep going a little bit and I'll, um, I might have to skip a little, but um, scholars have pointed to 1967 as a critical year in um, pushing Podhoritz's politics rightwards. That was the year that he published Making It, his first autobiography. Um, which ends up, um, he spoke openly about his ambition to make it in literary New York, about his ambition to sort of be a famous writer. And he expected that the book would be celebrated and instead it was um, trashed uh, in reviews, both by the mainstream press and by his fellow New York intellectuals. Now that summer was also uh, the 1967 Six Day War uh, and Deborah Dashmore, I'm gonna now ad lib a little bit to get ahead, but Deborah Dashmore, a historian of American Jewry, has sort of argued that um, you know, mainstream newspapers from time to life to Newsweek were really taken by Israel's sort of military might um, uh, and sort of celebrated an image of muscular virility um, in 67, which seemed like such a contrast to what was happening in Vietnam. Um, as the Cold War anti-consensus was crumbling. Uh, and I argue, and um, I'm not the first, that for um, many Americans, uh, well, I should say for, well, I'll come back to this. So, so there's sort of this image of virility uh, and muscular sort of militarism that's emerging in 1967. And for many conservatives and some cold warriors, including the emerging neocons, and I'm not the first person to argue this by any means, Israel becomes a model for how to wield military might and power effectively. And especially in the later part of the 1970s when conservatives are fretting over a so-called Vietnam syndrome, um, this reluctance they feel by America to use its military might in the world, Israel is held up as a model sort of of positive militarism, okay? And conservative critics of Vietnam or of the Vietnam syndrome looked to Israel again as this sort of masculine model of military might in foreign affairs, okay? As did Podhoritz and the emerging neocons. Um, well, I'll I don't know if this is going to get all, this is my last slide. It might come up or not. Anyways, um, so the various gender discourses um, that Podhoritz and Dechter had been writing about throughout the 1960s and 70s come together in an article that Podhoritz wrote in 1977 called The Culture of Appeasement. It appears in Harper's Magazine. And in it, Podhoritz makes this um, sort of odd comparison that the United States in the 1970s was like Great Britain in the interwar years, okay? Um, uh, and that both of those countries suffered from um, a naive pacifism, okay? That had emerged um, in Great Britain. It was sort of this uh, discontent with the war um, even though, you know, the discontent with World War I and for the United States, it was um, dissatisfaction with the Vietnam War. But here's where it gets interesting and I'm gonna add look because I wanna end. Podhoritz explicitly blamed um, this state of affairs both in Great Britain in the, 1930, in the 1920s and 30s, which led to the appeasement of Hitler, okay? And to the United States in the 1970s on homosexuals. He's a completely explicitly clear. And he talks about homosexual writers um, sort of being so influential in these years that they helped um, 
spread a series of ideas, um, and here I'm going to quote him, uh, uh, that represented the refusal of fatherhood and all that fatherhood entailed, responsibility for a family, and therefore the inescapable implication in the whole destiny of a society, um, and in assuming direct responsibility for fate of country. He's writing this about Great Britain. He's talking about British writers like W.H. Auden. Um, I'm not as sort of familiar with British writers, but sort of pointing out to a bunch of them who were gay, who were prominent in these years, who he is saying have sort of undue, un, an undue amount of influence. And then he says, anyone familiar with homosexual apologetics in the United States will recognize these attitudes here, okay? Um, and they are spread by such openly homosexual writers as Allen Ginsberg, James Baldwin, and Gore Vidal. And the result was an emasculated America, Podhoritz argued, unprepared to guard itself against the, third, um, the Soviet Union. Okay. And I'm going to end here. I don't know how I lost so much track of time. Um, but you can, I hope you can see sort of how Dechter and Podhoritz's writings are sort of intersecting in these years. Um, and gender, you know, after the end of the Cold War, the neocons are sort of floating about in the 1990s. But after the attacks, the September 11th attack, they take a lot of that sort of, you know, muscular, um, masculine ideas in that they applied to the Vietnam syndrome uh, and to the Soviet Union in the later parts of the Cold War and bring it into the war of terror. But the part that's super interesting is again, most of the people who associated with neoconservatism by the, you know, by the 1990s were not the original neocons, but Norman Podhortz and Mitch Dechter are this thread that runs throughout. And they're some of the most fierce uh, defenders of conservative politics um, and, you know, today, most of the neocons, people who identify as neocons, were anti-Trumpers, okay? Podhoritz, on the other hand, came to admire Trump. Why did he admire Trump? Uh, because, and here I'm quoting him, when I was a kid, um, you would rather be beaten up than back away from a fight. The worst thing in the world you could be called was a sissy. Trump is no sissy. He fights back, Podhoritz said. If you hit him, he hits back and he is an equal opportunity counter puncher. His virtues are the virtues of a street kid in Brooklyn. You don't back away from a fight and you fight to win. And I'm gonna end, I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't, anyways, I'm gonna end. <laughs> Are there questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, First, uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Ronnie. And you didn't go on too long at all. I mean, that was uh, that was great. Yeah. And we, we do we do have time for a few questions. Okay. And um, the only thing I might suggest is um, maybe end your screen. Oh yeah. So we I can see you fully. Um, and, where to end screen share? Okay. And um, I'll let, uh, I I I have I have. I have a bunch of questions always, but let me at last let other people ask because I'm in no rush and I can always call you later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, if anyone wants to either literally put their hand up or use the hand raise uh, icon. I'm trying to look at everybody's um, thing, but um, I don't know if I'll see everyone. We have more than one panel. Okay, this is Zoom shyness, so I will ask a question <laughs> while other people um, get over it. Um, uh, uh, let me ask you, so other than being an incredible chronicle of misjudgments, um, I, 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 I'm fascinated, is there any real difference regarding the uh, uh, second, gener second generation feminism between let's say a Midge Dector and a Phyllis Shafley? And I, I guess, um, like, I guess connected to that is another question. It seems like lesbianism was kind of an obvious and easy target for Dechter because what else could you say about the second generation feminists? You can't call them communists, and she didn't want to probably call them Jews, which of the, you know, the second charge would have had quite a bit of. Uh, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of the second generation feminists were, of course, Jewish, 
So I, maybe you could just say a little bit more about that. Um, well, with Phyllis Schlafly, and I, I think I probably mentioned this in my last talk because um, I opened with the talk, you know, when I when my chapter talks about that, you know, Midge Dector initially didn't like Phyllis Schlafly. In the early 1970s, I have a quote where she sort of says, you know, if that Bella Abzug and Phyllis Schlafly can have one another, um, Bella Abzug being the 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 um, very liberal congresswoman from New York who wore um, big hats famously, um, Jewish also. Uh, when I asked Dector about that comment when I interviewed her, she didn't. She claimed not to remember it, and she also said, she, "Oh no, Phyllis Schlafly is super important. I hugely admire her." Um, and I think then she told me at some point um, she uh, she actually apologized. So maybe she did remember. She did because she said, I, "I apologized to her at a speech at the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative." think tank and in you know it, I make the point that Dector is the only woman who's appointed to the board or Dector and um or is one of the only women appointed to the board of the Heritage Foundation uh and the the head of that foundation sort of says you know Dector connects all the various wings of the you know conservative movement um she's really important and you know so she came to admire Phyllis Schlafly and basically their their views very much intersect okay um, in terms of what she had a lot to say about second wave, I think if she were here right now, she would disagree with you that lesbianism was the only way to attack that movement. I mean, she attacked every single aspect of it. You know, she she um, had you know she basically said that people who were attracted to the movement, the women who were attracted, um, were entitled and spoiled. This is sort of the critique she's making of um, the baby boom generation broadly, um, and that they don't want to work as they don't want to work hard. Um, in this meritocracy, right? So if women aren't getting ahead, it's not because they're facing gender discrimination, it's because they're, they're, they're coddled and they're complaining and they, they don't know how to, you know, they don't know how to write well. And they, they, they you know, if they get criticized, they, they fall apart because they spent their lives in the 50s and 60s growing up in prosperous affluent America where their parents just tried to please them, okay? So I think, you know, and her book is filled with, critiques. So, um, and you know, my, she's, Dector is the fiercest critic of women's liberation, um, but the other women New York intellectuals weren't fans of the movement either. Um, you know, and I think part of it is because they felt like they had made it. They had gone through this, you know, whatever. Um, they made it in a man's world, like they, they wrote like men. And so, you know, Gender just sexism wasn't really real, even though they all encountered it. Um, and that's actually a chapter I'm working on now, trying desperately to finish, um, to think about how women who weren't Midge Dector, who stayed, you know, liberal, why they oppose second wave feminism too. So that might have been long. Other questions? I just looked up Irving Howe and I found he's the best. <laughs> is he the best? Yeah. I found that I was in a meeting with him at Stanford. Which is, oh. which is mentioned in the Googling. Uh, in 1969? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how does he fit into this? I mean, at the time, it was just about Vietnam, as far as I could see. I no, mean, we viewed have, him, we young leftists viewed him as a, a as a real old leftist, but it was Vietnam. I, I love Irving Howe. I have, so I, my book is now organized as case studies of individuals. Um, and it, the reason I did that is because the New York intellectuals are so prolific and there's the books on, there's so much on them that I, I was getting lost. And so I have chapters on Norman Midge, one on chapter on Norman Potter, it's one on Midge, one on Irving Howe as a case study of the left. And then Diana Trilling is my case study of a woman. And Irving Howe is a New York intellectual. He stays on the left. Um, he founds dissent um, as an answer to sort of the you know, hard anti-communism of the commentary crew in the 1950s. Um, but he's critical of the 60s social movements too. Um, and he's definitely critical of women's liberation. He writes a pretty nasty critique of um, Kate Millett's sexual politics. Um, but notably, he only republished that essay once. Um, Irving Howe was very famous for publishing. Um, he has tons of collections of essays. Um, and that one he only published once. And I interviewed a lot of people who knew him when I was writing my chapter. He's no longer alive. He died in 1993, um, including Michael Walzer, who um, uh, became the editor of Dissent After, and his wife, uh, Judith Walzer, and some younger social Democrats, women who came of age in Dissent in the 1980s. And they said that, you know, Howe really softened his views, 
especially when it came to women that, you know, he was steeped in the old left where class is the fundamental distinction. And so he just couldn't understand, um, you know, what these women were talking about in terms of sexism, but he later changed his mind and dissent actually became quite an open space for women in the 80s and in the 90s. In terms of younger radicals, um, you know, he was dismayed. I mean, I think the, you know, the dissent crew was eventually really originally really excited about the new left. Uh, and I think they felt rejected in sort of like a fatherly type of way. Um, and Irving Howe was very harsh with new leftists in 1969 at Stanford in 1968. Um, and but he later also softens on that too, right? And people like um, Todd Gitlin uh, and Tom Hayden reconnect with Irving Howe when they're older as well. Um, and so they're sort of, you know, but I think one of the great regrets of Irving Howe is that the new left and the old left weren't able to come together in the 1960s. Um, but Irving is one of, my, is probably, you know, it's like one of my favorite of these figures. I hope that answered it, Dan. Yeah. Well, world of our fathers is, is truly great. Yes, yeah. um, and you know, and I argue. Sorry, I should say in the bigger book, I'm. I say, you know, Irving Howe remains tied to a very scholarly and intellectual model of Jewish masculinity, and I think one of his critiques of the New Left is that they're not scholarly, they're not intellectual, they're all about, you know, they don't think theories through, and there's like a gendered component. Whereas someone like Norman Podhortz embraces a very different model of masculinity that shape his politics. Um, so that's where I'm going in the book too. Anyone else? Can I ask a question? Um, if it's okay with everyone to stay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, first, I was so happy to hear this. I was like, I, you know, I've heard a bit about your work over the years, but this is just, it's so fabulous. And really this was so interesting um, and I learned a lot. So thank you. Um, and then I, I, one of the things that stood out to me that I found really interesting was that the Jews that I study are almost all immigrants and it, and I was wondering, are, are the ones that are, the people that you're talking about, are they all, have they all been born? Were they all born in the United States? And how that, I, I just thought that was something that was really interesting to me and sort of what, what you sort of make of that. And then the other question was, you said, I mean, you've interviewed so many people. Um, and what do Midge and Norman think of your work? <laughs> Um, oh, that's fascinating. I'm t um, I, I, Norman would not be interviewed. Um, Norman is, I think, very, you know, the Philip Roth biography just came out. That's a whole nother thing. But um, one of the, you know, is Philip Roth was really controlling of his legacy. Um, so was Norman Podhortz. He, he still is. Um, so he was not interested in being um, interviewed. And Midge told me he's interviewed out. Um, when I met Midge, I was really, we had a lovely conversation. Um, I was on her Upper West Side apartment for, or Upper East Side apartment, I should say, they're on the East Side for like, you know, three hours. Um, I don't know what she thinks about my work because I haven't published it yet um, uh, in terms of her. Uh, and I'm sort of terrified. <laughs> Um, of what, I'm, I think part of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of terrified of the neoconservative milieu. Um, her children, John Podhortz is now the editor of commentary. So I try not to think about what they're gonna think. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I don't think that they would necessarily um, agree with it, but um, I'm not sure. So I don't know, and you know, they're still alive. Um, I don't wish death on anyone, but you know, maybe they won't be alive when the book comes out. I don't wish it, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so I don't know, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, and I suppose once I publish something, I will send Midge a, deck, uh, a, a letter, but now some, you know, some years have gone by. Um, as to the immigrant question, they're all, most of them are children of immigrants. And so in my early chapters in the thirties, the being child of immigrants is central to their understanding of Jewishness. You know, people have argued that they actually were trying to escape their Jewishness as children of immigrants. Um, and I sort of counter and say, actually, they kind of were redefining Jewishness through this Jewish masculine world that they created. Um, and later they come back to Jewishness. Um, uh, they're radicals, the old, you know, they're Trotskyists, some of them opposed America's entry into World War II, and it's something they regret after the Holocaust, obviously. I mean, it's fast, you know, that's the Trotsky line was that um, uh, this was a capital, you know, this was a war between capitalists. Um, we're not going to get involved. Um, so immigration is a part of the story 
early on. They're children of immigrants, um, but they're most of them are born in the United States. So, thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, I think in respect of the time and uh, Dr. Grimsberg's uh, work later today, um, why don't we uh, just uh, uh, give uh, give her a round of applause? I'm going to thank you, thank her. Thank you. And again, hopefully, I will never talk about this project again. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about it as many project. times as you want, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so I, I, let me thank everybody for coming today and um, have a, a good and uh, relaxful end of the semester uh, for the students. Good luck on the uh, finishing up successfully and for the teachers, uh, good grading and uh, see you very soon. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>